Thank you very much for the invite, uh, Valerie, and uh, thank you for the help, Pierre. I'm butchering the, the names, but sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, this research that I'm going to present today is the result of a collaboration between Eindhoven, University of Technology, and Fullscout. Uh, and uh, we already have the output of both of them uh, published. I'm going to put the papers at the end for you to see. The first one is Cyber Threat Intelligence to Incident Response, and the second work is How You Do the Other Way Around. Um, this is why I have this title. A little bit about myself. Uh, as he said, my name is Christopher Leitchi. Sometimes I pronounce it wrong when I'm talking in English because I'm living in the Netherlands and they don't understand if I don't pronounce it like that. So I got used to talking about myself uh, in the wrong way, uh, saying my own name wrong. Okay, uh, I am a PhD student at the Eindhoven University, as Pia has said. I'm also a guest researcher as, at Forescout. This is how this link came to be. Now we have many other collaborations between the two entities. Um, I've been there since 2020, and uh, I also have some experience with uh, IT product project management with the Brazilian government. I worked there for a long time before moving here. Um, I did my master's at the University of Brasilia, which is the city where I am from. And uh, I also participated in some EU research projects like 5G Range, where I did my master's, uh, the Sunrise Project, and now on the Dutch National Intersect, which also financed this uh, research here. Okay, a little bit for today. We have a, an agenda with uh, four, five main things to, to talk about. The first thing, I'm going to give you some background with the problem and the motivation behind the work that we did. Uh, we, I'm also going to talk about how to map attacker's behavior to the things that you see in the network and to the information that you see online. And then I'm going to talk about using cyber threat intelligence for incident response, and then going the other way around, sharing the things that you see in your network as CTI. Uh, some background. What is cyber threat intelligence for those who don't know CTI? Uh, is any knowledge that you have about the capabilities of an attacker, about the victims of an attacker. There are many examples that you can see. Uh, there are many sources of CTI. Uh, interesting, interestingly enough, when a good source of cyber threat intelligence is uh, X, also known as Twitter, they, uh, a lot of people publish things there because it's practical, you can follow people and see many reports. Usually it's not machine readable because it's just text, but okay, uh, but how is this actually used and shared nowadays? Well, let's see how you use cyber threat intelligence. Imagine that you have an incident in your network, your network intrusion detection systems goes there, gives you some alerts about what happened, and then an analyst will study those alerts, and then the analyst can use uh, information, it searches information uh, online, about what happened with other people and try to use this information to help them respond to this incident. This information that they are using for that is what we call cyber threat intelligence of course, this shared information. Okay, but how is this shared? How do you share the things that you learn? Kind of going the other way around, your needs will provide you with some alerts and then the analyst will study that, will analyze what happened there and then you share this information as cyber threat intelligence to help other people. But the main question is how much is actually shared? How much CTI is actually shared? You can guess, oh yeah, there is a lot of CTI there, there is a lot of information about attacks, right? Well, it depends a lot on the level of information that you have uh, in CTI. There is this framework called the detection maturity level that tells you how much you know about a specific attack. If you don't know anything about an attack, of course you are level zero, you know nothing about it. If you know what they use for that attack, the indicators of compromise like uh, the IPs, the hashes of the files of the executables, also the domains that the attackers use to attack you from, you reach level two, kind of level three, depending on how much information you have. If you know the behavior that the attacker had and how this was reflected in your network, then 
you increase that level at least to level six, five kind of, you know, the tactics, the techniques and the procedures, the TTPs that the attackers uh, use when trying to get access to your network, like exfiltration, privilege escalation, and many other types. If you know the strategy, if you know the goals of the attackers, you reach level eight, you know why they did that with you. And finally, of course, if you know who did that, then you, you have all the information that you can about an attack, at least the information about how it happened and why that happened. There are some information also on how you can defend it, et cetera, but this is separate. This is like courses of action and other things. What is, what do you think, if, if you were in my presentation on Cyber Hunt, uh, you cannot answer this question because you already know, <laughs> but what is the level of most CTI used and shared in your opinion? What do you think is the level that we can find out there? Could say two to three? Yes. Uh, Yes, basically <laughs> level two. Okay. And why? Well, because it's easy to automate that. It's easy to see an IP in your network. It's, you detected it as malicious. You see that there is a, a malware there. Okay, but just export that to someone. It's in a list. Someone can import that. Uh, I am, let's say, a uh, trustworthy source. So they will trust the things that I share. So they can just import the information that I shared with them. Then we come to a problem. Anything that is above that is really hard to come by. We assume that is there somewhere for you to, us to use, but it's usually in human readable language. So we have to analyze it. We have to process that before we can actually use it. And uh, of course, it's when we actually come by this type of information. It's not always the case. This brings us to three main questions. The first of all, the first of these questions is, we have this attacker, we have the, their behavior. How can we map this information? How can we take this behavior that they have and map this to the things that we see in our NITs? How can we describe that in an automated manner? Which brings to us to the two sub-questions out of it. The first one, how can we use this information automatically? And the second one, how can we create this information automatically, the high-level information, the, 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 the more detailed one, the more um, difficult to describe. Uh, so, first of all, how to describe attacker's behavior. Well, the goal here is try to have a way to automate the description of the behavior of the attacker. The behavior of the attacker, as I said, is anything that is in between the level three, not actually level three because just the tools that you see there, etc. but it's mostly the TTPs, tactics, the techniques and procedures. Well, there are some ways, cyber uh, queue chain, there is the diamond model as well, you can use them, but they are not very, uh, let's say, and they don't have a high granularity for description. The most accepted, the most used one is of course, the attack framework from Mitri. And basically it's a framework that tries to describe a behavior of an attacker in, um, based on the most uh, common attacks that happen and uh, it's a community effort. They are always updating it. So what can we do with that? Well, we can just take the alerts that we have in our network and we can create a map to those CTPs by using MyTree. Uh, it sounds really uh, straightforward, right? You take the alerts, you map them to the CTPs and et cetera. But if I have time in the end, I'm going to show you something interesting about this map. Uh, in this case, we were only uh, focusing on network detection. So we took the list of the network related ones that might reclassify a network uh, that is actually network intrusion detection. Uh, we didn't focus on the host based ones, but you can. You can do the same thing for the host based ones. We have other, other people that did something similar. We have contact with them and et cetera. They did kind of the same thing, but for host information. Uh, and the idea is, of course, just map this behavior to the alerts that we have in our network. Uh, we, the ones that are marked here in blue are the ones that we could actually map a alert to them. We, we didn't do like a lot because of course we are limited by the amount of alerts that we have in our needs and what it can detect as well. One example here, if we have the remote blacklisted operation on file uh, from Suricata, 
we can just add a tag to them, to, to this alert saying, this is a lateral movement, this is a lateral tool transfer technique being applied. By the way, uh, maybe I didn't comment this, but the way that this framework uh, operates is basically each of these columns is a static, and in the, the lines, you have different techniques out of those statics. If you want the procedures, procedures are basically either just one technique being used for a purpose, or when you combine techniques in order, you can call that a procedure used by the attacker. Um, okay, now that we have the map, let's try to use the map and share the information by, by uh, applying it. Um, okay, first we use. How uh, did we decide to go with that? We proposed a methodology that is divided in four main steps. Uh, three of them happen before the attack uh, is seen in your, in your network. You have to prepare yourself for that. So these three uh, first steps are, first you gather some CTI, then you filter the CTI to see the ones that actually have some behavior there, some CTPs. Uh, then you build what we call a pattern, which is basically just a set of, um, of uh, alerts that you are expecting out of them by mapping the TTPs from the, the CTI to the, the set. And then after uh, an incident happens, you can use the, um, you can use, did I bring my whiteboard? Sorry. You can use uh, those patterns to match with the traffic that you see in your network. I'm going to show you an example here. So uh, we did something uh, you put with this uh, approach to create a pattern specifically for the malware family uh, are evil. Um, first, you gather the alerts, the reports, as we said. And here I'm just showing the ones that we knew that had some TTPs and etc. but we took way more than this just for the for the our evil one. Then we filter those ones that had some network related TTPs, took those CTPs and build a pattern in a JSON file that describes what it is and etc. It's basically just a set indicating each alert that we expect in case uh, we observe something that is related to our evil. Then we go to that framework that we had with Mitri. If something is seen in my network what do I do with it? Well, I take a look at the alerts that um, that my needs gave me, and then just apply the mapping that we had before and try to match it with the patterns that we created for each of the malware families that we know. There are some ways that we can go over to try to um, look for different malware families. Uh, we describe some ways that you can do, but mostly we just focus on the incidents um, and on the indicators of compromise that we know that are related to some malware families. Okay, so now we have a pattern that can describe this behavior. Okay, that's really nice, right? But does it work? Well, to test that, we created some patterns for the malware families that we actually found CTI, and that's a problem that will come uh, later because it's really difficult to find CTI with a high level information. This is the whole reason why we did the second part of the work. Uh, then we create the patterns with the CTI that is that we could find. We match malware traffic that we can replay for these malware families, and we see if they are actually being able to, to uh, say this is this malware family, this is the other malware family. You can use this CTI to defend yourself against it, or you can use this other one. Uh, we use multiple samples from these families, from multiple um, uh, from from a database that we had with um, different dates of, of this attack, specifically from the R Evo and the server. And then we test two things to see if we uh, arrive there, the predominance of the alerts, basically checking what is the percentage of the alerts that I see in my needs that match the, that one. Uh, someone asked when I showed them this, if we were, would be able to detect, for example, if two attacks are happening at the same time, because of course you are going to have different alerts. Uh, there are some studies that show that two attacks happening at the same time is very unlikely. So in this case, we would not be able to identify, but of course, it's a very niche case. Uh, and the second thing that we test is the confidence, which is basically seeing if the majority of the alerts are related to that family. It's also analyzing the percentage, but just checking what is the threshold of the majority there. 
Um, and last, we validate this information with two additional MARA families, Crisis and WannaCry. Those were the families that we could find good alerts for them. But as I said, there is no uh, high-level CTI available for them with more samples that we can compare to. By the way, if you have any questions, you can stop me at any time. Um, OK, after we tested this, we saw that it actually works. Uh, we had a matching rate, not necessarily a detection rate, but more just matching, of 94%, round 94%, an accuracy of 96%, a really low false positive rate and a really low false negative um, false negative rate as well. Well, nice, really good, right? Yeah, but the problem is it was a limited scenario. We didn't have a lot of samples to do that. So we tested on the ones that we could find, which was a question that I had more than once about in, in different, uh, even in this paper, at the other one, I had the same question. How could you find that? Well. It's difficult to find. It's really difficult to find CTI related that, that has some high level information. This is what we are trying to solve. We already not we're now we already have the map, right? So why don't we take this map and we also use it to create our own CTI? We did just that. We created a second work, which we propose another methodology to take the things that you see in your network, extract information out of it, and generate a report for your analysts to, to also to facilitate the life of the analyst, because this is the main goal here. Try to not overwhelm your analyst with information. And that's a huge problem, because if you just have to go over a lot of reports, read everything, see everything that yourself manually, how much time do you have to do that? How many reports are out there? We are just trying to basically solve this problem here. So to generate the, the things yourself, we do four main steps. All of them, uh, yeah, all of them happen after you suffer an attack because you already have the map, right? So you can just do this uh, first extracting a graph out of your network. Then you build what we call an alert chain. I'm going to go on uh, more details on what this means, what we do and etc. And then we apply the same map, but the other way around. And finally, we generate some reports out of that. Um, OK, let's go over each of those steps with some nice figures to make it easier. <laughs> so the first one, uh, you have your network intrusion detection system giving you alerts, right? What we do, we extract a graph out of it because, yeah, it's the natural output of an it. Your network is a graph by itself. The alerts at the edges, the hosts at the vertices. OK, nice. Now. What we want to, to focus on is the propagation of the attack. We want to see what are all the devices that the attack came to. So we make what we call an alert chain that is a time consistent graph. And uh, it's also directed, acyclic, and uh, it's a subgraph of that graph that we had before. It's acyclic because it's really difficult to deal with the cyclic graphs when we go to the next step. Uh, I'm going to explain it later why. Uh, we take these graphs and then we extend them with the related alerts and the observables. If you think a little, you will notice that we extended it with some alerts that were not the main ones there, right? So we might create actually some cycles here. But the thing is, all the cycles that we add here, they are under a lower hierarchy than the other ones. The other ones are the main ones. These are just accessory graphs. So they are subsumptive. They can be removed and they will not change the way that we are talking about the propagation. They are just additional information. And this helps us uh, later, as I said, because now we have what we call knowledge graphs. They, we, we call them mostly acyclic, which is good enough for, for the, the purpose that we want. And uh, well, we have the map, right? We just take the map and we apply it directly to this graph. So we have all the TCPs that happened in our networks, in our, in our network during this incident. Okay. Finally, because we have a map, a, a graph, a graph by itself is a machine readable structure. We can take this and just convert it to six or to any other format that you have to describe your uh, cyber threat intelligence. Six is the most used one, so we just 
using it because uh, and because this is a knowledge graph it's really easy to convert this into human, human readable information we have many ways of doing that specifically we use a built uh, approach which is just create simple uh, phrases based on the, the on the sequences that it takes uh, basically you have uh, always an entity an action and an object so it's quite easy to generate human readable information out of it. And this is why we don't include the loops in the main graphs, only in the in the sub substantive part. Because if you try to generate uh, things with NLP when you have loops, depending on the method that you use, it can go crazy because it will, will just start to loop over and over and over, and we will never see what is the priority of leaving that loop at some point, if it just keeps saying the same thing. Uh, and with that, we can generate reports that include, of course, low-level information as well, because the LS themselves uh, add, have uh, the observables that we have in our network, like the IPs and etc. They also have the domains, of course. And uh, not only that, but the high level. And the analysts can validate that by just using the human readable information that we show to them while we are uh, uh, analyzing the attack. Again, really nice. Really cool, but does it work? Well, we tested this again. Uh, we took some samples from uh, malicious traffic. We replayed those samples. Uh, this this time we expanded them with uh, more samples that we could analyze that we knew that would generate some some uh, let's say alerts from different families this time. Uh, this sample, this case here, I think we had like way more than the first one. Uh, and then we just generate some CTI out of it. And we validate the CTI by matching it with existing ones when they are available. Um, and then we evaluate two main things. The first one is the information that is being generated correct. Like, do we have the right CTPs there? And the second thing, uh, is it complete? We call it complete, but it's not complete because we don't know what is complete in this case. We have relatively relative completeness. We can only compare that to the things that someone already documented, right? So we just compare to the ones that are available. And uh, for the for the first one, by the way, uh, if it's not available, we just manually check it to see if it's actually what you uh, should be getting as an output. Okay, for the results, the for the completeness. Uh, our tests were able to generate all the TTPs expected. Maybe this is not the best visualization for now, but the idea is we expected these two TTPs specifically for that family. And uh, here, just two examples. If it's way bigger, I have a, a, a bigger one. If you want to look, I can show it later. But basically, for all the samples that we had there, they matched it. And some of them, you will see, they generated more TTPs than were manually re reported before. Well, that's nice, right? Well, it's if, if it's correct. So what we did, we went there and we checked as well. And we uh, saw that this also matched with the malicious traffic, which means that it achieved correctness. Um, as you can see, uh, we have uh, many different families here. We had many different samples for these families, more for some than others. But for our case, it didn't have a lot of impact in how we analyzed it. Um, okay, some conclusions on future work. Um, the architecture that we have here, the approach that we had here, we wanted to automate the use and the creation of CTI. We wanted to take the CTI that is available there and match with the things that we were seeing in our network, and then take the things that we are seeing in our network and share it for people to also use it. We show that this, we try to make this in a way that is compatible with the existing solutions because we don't want to just create something that is only uh, feasible to be used with our own solution, our own needs. Uh, one good thing that we did was try, was improving the, um, the level of CTI that is available there or the level that you can generate and, and use to level six. And uh, as future work, future kind of because we already submitted this other work which is increasing it to level nine to the maximum level which is trying to attribute the attack to someone 
We submitted this, I think, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, how many time did I spend right now? I would know about 20, 25. But okay, good. Well, sure. um, Lots of time. A future kind of work is uh, the alert mapping. So it's really demanding to do that. It's really, really demanding to do that. And uh, it would be good if someone could have an initiative, would propose this, to include this type of things in common, common vulnerability databases like the MGD, the IC set, the ICS set, and etc. Thank you for watching my presentation. I hope you liked it. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer.